we thank you and praise you, Father, for this new day that you have made. God, this morning, we choose to rejoice. We choose to be glad, Father. Lord, we choose to enter into your gates with thanksgiving. Father, we thank you, God, that you're so good to us for your mercy that endures forever, God. Lord, I thank you for your mercy that is new every single morning. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, this morning we set our eyes and our hearts upon you. God, we just want to love on you and minister unto you this morning, Jesus. Lord, you're so worthy, so worthy to receive glory and honor. We love you, Lord. Come on, church, lift your voice and just praise him this morning. We love you.
your heart. Come on, just take a moment. Oh, we exalt you, Jesus. We call you Lord. You're the Lord of our life. Come on, bless his name. Come on, let's worship him. Come on, enter into his presence. Oh, we glorify your holy name. Oh, Lord.
that we approach these places in Scripture and that we wrestle with them and get with the Holy Spirit and get the revelation. Many times the, the Scriptures that are most uncomfortable are the areas, the gold mines, if you will, that hold the most revelation for us. Can I have an amen? amen. So, so we're going to talk about this. And he says, Abraham, so it says, uh, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two young men with him and his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering and began the trip to the place where God had told him. The third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And Abraham said to his servants, settle down and stay here with the donkey. I and a young man will go yonder and worship. Everybody say, I'm a worshiper. And come again to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on the shoulder of Isaac, his son. Here is Isaac, who is a picture of Jesus, carrying the wood that would be, uh, which would be part of the burnt offering, a picture of Jesus carrying my cross and your cross. Yeah. And here, here he goes, carrying this wood for the burnt offering. He took the fire pot in his own hand, the knife, two of them went on together. And Isaac said to Abraham, my father, here I am, son. See here at the fire, the wood, where is the lamb? For the burnt sacrifice. Abraham said my son God himself. Will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. The two went on together. What you got to realize at this time. Scholars say that Isaac was in his 20's. Some say in his 30's. Abraham was in his 100's. So keep that in mind. And he says when they came to the place. Which God had told him. Abraham built an altar there. He laid the wood in order. Bound Isaac his son. Laid him on the altar of the wood. And Abraham. Just in other words, in verse 9, this was not a wrestling match going on between a 100-year-old and a 20-year-old. Abraham stretched forth his hand and took hold of the knife to slay his son. Abraham was all in, wasn't he? And the angel of the Lord said, Abraham, here I am. And he answered, here I am. He said, don't lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear and reverence God since you've not held back from me or begrudge giving me your son your only son. And Abraham looked up and glanced around. Behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering and an ascending sacrifice instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Amen. And it said to this day on the mount, the Lord will <coughs> provide it. It will be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time. He said, I've sworn by myself, says the Lord, since you've done this thing, have not withheld from me or begrudged giving me your son, your only son. In blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heavens and the sand on the seashore. And your seed, your heir, will possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed, in other words, Christ, in your seed, Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and by him bless themselves, because you have heard and obeyed my voice. And Abraham returned to his servants, and they rose up and went with him to Beersheba and Abraham, and there Abraham lived. How many are thankful that you are of the seed of Abraham, and through Abraham you are blessed? Through Jesus you are blessed. Heavenly Father, come on, sorry, give me a praise and thank you. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you are all in with us. We thank you today, Holy Spirit, as you open, reveal, and unveil the Word of God to us, that we will draw closer to you, that you will encourage us as we are on this journey of being all in with you, God. We thank you for the awesome fruit in your kingdom and what you're going to do through our lives as we yield to you and follow you and draw closer to you in intimacy than we've ever been. And hearing your voice, God, we're going to see you do awesome, supernatural, powerful things. We thank you for that. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, Amen. 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 And just turn to somebody beside you and tell them it's another bad day for the devil. <laughs> turn to the person on the other side and tell them the Lord will provide. Lord He's got it. Don't worry about it. As I said, this is one of the most uncomfortable stories in all of Scripture. And there's a lot of tension going on in this narrative because we... we Think, how could God even suggest to Abraham what he's telling him to do? And, and what I, as I said before, a lot of times when we see Scripture 
uh, these areas that hold so much tension and are so uncomfortable and hard to understand, many times the Holy Spirit uses those things to unlock to us greater revelation understanding of Himself. As you read the Word of God, see, we read about Noah, we read about Abraham, and we see this progression through Scripture of people drawing closer to God. And even Moses knew God in a way that even Abraham did not know. And we see through these individuals in Scripture that had a walk in a relationship and an intimacy with God. And they continue through Scripture to raise the benchmark of where we can be in our relationship with God. And so as we see Abraham, we see here an individual totally sold out, totally, completely, all in with God. And when we see that, we see things in his life that parallel us, our walk with God, this meaning of life that we're in, the relationships that we have that speak so powerfully to us. Let me just say this. How many of you, you're here, you grew up between the 60s and the 90s, and uh, you all remember on television hearing that old faithful sound. This is a test. This is only a test of the emergency broadcasting system. How many of y'all remember that? Yeah. Remember that? Some of you young kids are like, what in the world? That is crazy. But what we have to understand, this was a test. God was testing Abraham. What God had suggested to Abraham, God was never intending Abraham to kill his own son. But God was testing Abraham. Just turn to somebody and tell them this is a test. This is a test. Turn to somebody on the other side. Guess what? God wants you to pass the test. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what's come against you. I know sickness may have come against your family. You may go, maybe be going through a financial turmoil. You're trying to transition. Maybe trying to go to the next level in your career or job or facing something in your marriage. But can I tell you, if you will yield to God, hear His voice, you will pass this test. When God, the teacher, gives a test, he does not give the test for you to fail. Amen. God does not want you, he, God's not a God that wants to put red ink all over your paper. And a matter of fact, God knows what, knows what how you do on the test before he gives the test anyway. Actually, a lot of times the tests are more about us learning more about him than it is him learning about us. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Woo! I don't know if y'all can hang with me today. I, I feel, I'm feeling this. I got in bed early. I, I set my clock yesterday morning, so I just went ahead and transitioned in my mind. <laughs> I'm ready to get here today. And here we got to understand this. Number one, we got to understand on this journey of being all in with God, here's some things we're going to discover. And if you haven't, you will. And that I've discovered in my own life. I'm not saying that I'm an expert, obviously, but I'm on this journey with you. And there are some things I've discovered. I've learned a lot of things by mistake. I mean, you can learn something from everybody, even learn what not to do. Amen or oh me. Number one, here's, here's what we've got to understand. And our faith, our faith and our character will be tested will be tested. Can I have an amen? amen? Amen. I know that makes you want to shout because we love tests, don't we? Oh man, tests. You live for tests. And, and incidentally, for the record, God's character is not on trial here. This is not about God's character. This is about Abraham's character, folks. And it's not God's character that's up for debate. This is not God's character in question. It was Abraham's character that was up for the test. God gives him a test. And according to Jewish tradition, he had faced a lot of tests. So here it is. This is like the ultimate test. The ultimate test to decide the final one. Abraham, are you all in? God's saying, I'm all in, Abraham. I'm putting all the chips on the table for you to bring the Messiah through human history. And here's what I found. I found there are moments in our life, write this down, when God will test us and we will determine, we will, God, we will under through these tests, it's going to be determined whether or not our lives are truly submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. <coughs> There's difficult tests to take. But the tests are going to reveal whether God's still on the throne. Or whether something else has been displaced of someone else, something else. And I think that God wanted Abraham to see this gift that God gave Abraham of Isaac. And here's Abraham. This is everything. This is his future. There's no other options. He's already messed up with Hagar and Ishmael. And, and think about the mess we've got in the Middle East because of that mistake. Now. Ishmael and Isaac. And so here's Abraham. This is it for Abraham. Here's his legacy. This is generation. This is his future. This is everything. And God's saying, Abraham, I delivered on the promise and I gave you this precious little boy. And here is God saying, now would you put this on the altar? Isn't that crazy? Well, that makes you shout, doesn't it? But here's what we got to understand. This will help us. We've got to know are the gifts that God gives us. Write this down. Don't allow the gifts that God gives you to become an idol. Understand God gave them Isaac in the first place. Understand everything you have in life, God gave it to you. Oh, I'm a self-made man. Oh, okay, are you really? You changed your diapers when you were a baby? You gave yourself the ability to breathe and walk and see and hear? No, no. Everything you have, your health, your, everything you have, the gifts, the abilities, the talents, where you are in life, the fact that you were born in this nation and not a third world country, everything we have and everything we are, i got news for you. Let me know it's a gift from God. How many of you are thankful for all? You ought to be, no, you are blessed. So blessed. Yeah, I'm not saying that to condemn. I'm saying that to encourage and help, help us see. And if God blesses you with financial, blesses you with finances and resources and wealth, that is a blessing from God to be used for the kingdom of God. But if we're not careful, the blessing can displace God and become more important to us than Him. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. God can bless you with that job, but don't let the job come before Him. Man, this is good preaching today. How many know God's the one? He gave you the skills and the ability. He's the one that opened the door in the first place. We recognize, God, it came from you. Don't let the gifts, don't let what God's put in your life become an idol and distract you and move you out of a place of intimacy from Him and that deep, wonderful, awesome love relationship with Him. Don't let those, understand, let those things pull you to Him and say, Jesus, I love you. You are so good. All these things are from you. It makes me just love you more and know you more. Wow. Young person, God sends a godly young woman, good-looking boyfriend, girlfriend. Don't let them come in front of you and God. Amen. Don't shout me down. Don't let relationships displace your relationship with God. At that moment, those things can become an idol. And I think we all have to realize, here's the thing. God, here, I wrote that I wouldn't want to miss this. God is, and you write this down, God is the end-all and he is the be-all. Write that down. God is the end all. God is, say it with me. God is the end all. And God is the be all. We exist to glorify God. And if you aren't careful, our relationship with God is so subtle, it can become selfish. Y'all still hear you go, huh? It can become utilitarian. Where oh, God all of a sudden is the means to the end of what we want. <laughs> I love you. Just say it with me. Pastor Paul, thank you that you love me. Okay, now we can move forward. So instead of worshiping God, all of a sudden we start worshiping these gifts that he's given us. And at that moment, this is a reason why this is an all-in test. Because I think God wants to see, Abraham, what's more important to you, the son, the gift, or the giver of the gift? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Am I still, Abraham, am I still the end all and the be all in your life? 
This is the ultimate all-in test. There's moments in our lives where God begins to bless us. Thank God for your comfortable, wonderful house. Thank God for your cable television. Thank God we live in a great city where there's uh, a lot of options and a lot of freedom and a lot of fun things to do. But if you allow those blessings to keep you out of serving God. God's blessed us finally, blessed us with so much, but have we allowed those things to where we don't put God first in our finances, we just do it when it's convenient to us. And there's going to be moments where God will test us every day. There is a test going on in our life. There is a test whether or not we're all in. And one of those moments for me is when God began to speak to me. And here I was. I was a bareback rider. I rodeo. Some of y'all know that. And God, and God miraculously came in. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was little. Kind of backtracked. Got close to, to the Lord at 19. Got filled with the Holy Spirit. Here I was. I was all in for rodeo. I was traveling, rodeoing. The Holy Spirit began to deal with me and speak to me where I knew that I was at a crossroads. And here I was at the high school state finals one year. And... And one of the rounds of the finals, I made an incredible ride on this horse, and, and I didn't mark the horse out. Some of y'all going to Rodeo Houston this year, and you go, they kind of explain the rules. I didn't mark the horse out. I got a no score. I was really ticked off and discouraged. After that ride behind the bucket shoes, the, a guy approached me and, and said, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. And he told me he's a rodeo coach of of Hillsborough College, which is just a small college outside of Waco, but it is nation, nationally known as a rodeo college, just a rodeo machine to put out rodeo athletes. He said, I feel like you have the ability. I can help you go to the next level to where you can be professional. He came in, and I, I was like, wow, here, here's what I've worked for. Here's what I've dreamed about. Here, here it is right in front of me. He said, I want to, he said, I want to talk to you about possibly coming on a scholarship. We've got a bucking pin. We've got horses. I've got code. We can videotape. We can help you tool your craft, get better. Uh, you know, we go around the country competing on our rodeo team and then help you get better, help you get your pro card and go pro. And I thought, here's everything that I, I wanted. And it was in that moment where God was drawing me away from that place. Thank God there's good Christian cowboys in that scene. There's people that love God, and God needs those people in that arena. But that's not what God wanted for me. And I had to make a choice. Am I going to go with God, or am I going to pursue my own dream? And there's times in life where maybe there's something you felt like. Because a lot of times somebody see that and they say, this is the will of God. Look at this door God's open." But you have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit and what He's speaking to you that God might say, no, it's not what I want for you. And you have to humble yourself and say, God, I'm going your way. I'm going your direction. I want to know, yes, God gave me that gift. He gave me that ability. But ultimately, that's not where God wanted me to go. And you know, I don't, I'm not going to go any more in, in depth with that. But there's times in those tests where we're going to get into this where you're going to have to sacrifice some things if you're going to go on with God. Amen. There's some things that are going to have, to have to die. And God laid a foundation. He pointed me on a different path. And praise God, let me just say, I'm so thankful. Uh, you want to go to the Houston Rodeo, see those guys getting thrown into fences and broken bones. I thank God I didn't do that. I got friends, I see them, they ride in the NFR and they're riding pro and they they uh, beating up their bodies and man, I pray for them, God help them and God use them in that arena to reach people for Christ. But let me tell you what I'm doing for God today, I think, you know, I would do it for free. I love what I do. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do anything else on the planet. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. And it just traces back to those falling moments. Are we going to go all in with God? Here's the turning point for me. I think that would describe a lot of us. Many times our relationship with God is inverted in the sense that our relationship with God, if we're not careful, and here I was at five, I grew up in church, but looking back, my relationship was really all about God help me do this thing. God help me in the rodeo arena to win. God helped me on the football field to play well. God helped me in the classroom to pass a test I didn't study for. Are you asking God to do what you're, to bless what you're doing, or you want to do what he's blessing? 
I said, are you asking God to bless what you're doing? Or are you willing to do what he's blessing? And we have to pursue and seek the face and the will of God for what that is. And I'm going to just tell you, uh, there's so many times it's all about, God, I want you to serve my purposes. Man, it's quiet in here. Is that my heart? <laughs> it wasn't about God's agenda for me. It's so subtle, this selfishness. Let me tell you, I'm not, I'm not beating you down. I'm talking about me. But my, it was about my agenda for God. I wanted the God of this universe to do everything, uh, revolve everything around me. And here's the question number two. You've got to ask yourself on this journey of being all in, are you following Jesus or you want Jesus to follow you? Are you following Jesus or are you really, you want Jesus just to follow Well, that is good preaching, pastor. Woo! I think that's the huge difference between all in, being all in, or holding back something from God. Not questioning your love for God. Not questioning your salvation. Not questioning you're on your way to heaven. We're talking about being all in for God. And Jesus said in John 12, 24, if you're going to serve me, you're going to be where I am. Amen. And you know why I think sometimes we're not willing to go all in? A lot of times, because I think many times we're scared. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe this is just me, but I think a lot of times we get scared because we think that somehow if we go all in, God's going to ask us to do something that yeah. we just absolutely do not want to do. That, you know, here I am, God, here I am, I'm yours. Okay, go to Africa. <laughs> Such a lie of the devil. I'm telling you, if God wanted you in Africa, you would be miserable in the best penthouse in Houston, Texas. In the lap of luxury. You would be absolute miserable in the deepest, darkest place in Africa. If that's where God wanted you, let me tell you something. You would be the most happy, fulfilled, satisfied, doing what God wanted you to do. Somebody give God a praise. I just want to say, many times, it's going to take sacrifice and risk. And I... And, and I'm not going to say this, God's going to, you know, there's going to be some things that are going to be hard that God is going to ask you to do. But I just want to say, at the end of the day, God's purpose is not to make your life miserable. <laughs> he wants you to be fulfilled and, and blessed and happy. And I love this. I subscribe to this. What Frederick, uh, author Frederick Beekner said, and I love this. This has to be taken in the context of the guardrail, living in the guardrails of God's will for your life. Remember, we got to put him first. When you put him first, he said, I'll give you the desires of your heart. But guess what? They're godly desires. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to, uh, you have to take this in context of, am I living in God's good, perfect, pleasing will? And here's what I believe. The voice that we should listen to most, and I think we should listen to, is the voice of our gladness. Some of y'all thought, oh man, God wanted me to do something miserable. He said this, I love this. You need to find the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. You need to find the place. What makes you fulfill? What floats your boat? What are you wired to do? What do you love? What are you passionate about? Put that together. God is trying to bridge the connection between us and and what he's put inside of us in hurting, dying, crying humanity and put that together. And that's when the kingdom of God is put on this earth through us. Yeah. Wow. I love that. And here's one of the things people, you know, especially, and I can speak to this because I, I is one, a church planter. And you say, well, how in the world, why in the world did y'all plant a church in Cypress, Texas? How in the world did y'all end up here? Let me tell you. Uh, you got to listen to the, vo the voice of the Spirit of God and go where He wants you to go. Amen. But let me tell you, if you do that, to you, that's the best place on the planet. Amen. There's nowhere else you would want to be. And, and at the end of the day, where would you want to live? Where would you want to raise your family? Uh, it's all about God. Somebody says, well, it's all about where God wants me to go. But can I tell you, God wired you and gifted you a certain way and also, where do you want to live? Where do you want to raise your kids? 
God understands that. Raise a family. Where do you want to be buried? Because I just want to tell you, that may be the place God wants you to be. And you can rest assured. Just say this, write this down. God has factored in all the variables. Let me say it this way. God has anticipated and he has a plan for the unknown future. God has a plan. He's got, he's got it all figured out. Some of y'all are just trying to factor it, figure it all out. Just like when your mind's going like a computer. You're just wearing yourself out and God's like, I got this. And, and let me just tell you, I love Houston, Texas. I love you. Am I the only one here that loves you? I love Houston. I love Houston, Texas. I love where we are. I love this city. I love the diversity. I love that this is an international city. I love that this is a foodie town. Amen. I love we're close to God. So close to San Antonio. Awesome. We, we, I'm a Texan. I'm a fifth generation native Texan. I love Texas. And I love Houston, Texas. Confession is good for the soul. I'm not ashamed of that. I love it. And I thank God puts that inside of us. He gives us the desires of our heart and the Holy Spirit will begin to download those desires into our heart when we spend time with Him. And He creates those desires. We've got to listen and sanctify those desires as we pursue God's will for our lives. Back, back to Abraham. Here's Abraham. He gets up early and he saddles this donkey and he gets everything ready to go. And one tradition says that Abraham actually got up early before Sarah got up because he didn't want to catch any flack from his wife. And some Jewish uh, tradition says that they were on the same page with it, but he thought maybe she'll change her mind, so I better get out early. Head out early. I know no couples have ever had any discussions like that. Any discussions like that at all. But it's just, we read these stories and we don't think about the dynamics. But I think if God came to me and said, I want you to sacrifice uh, one of your sons, being broke might have a little discussion about it. Amen. Amen. Let's just say, and the truth is, here we, here we are, and, we, and here's something that I've mentioned, but we overlook in this story. Here's Isaac. He's a man in his 20s, some say in his 30s. And, he's, and his dad is a centenarian. He's over 100. Let me just say, Abraham's not the wrestling champion in the family anymore. And so what you see here in Isaac is a young man who's totally submitted to the will of his father. And I believe that Isaac, some say that Isaac asked his father, Father, please bind my hands. Bind, bind me, Father, because if I see the knife, I might flinch. And I don't want to do that. Here's this young man who could have taken him down and said, No, I'm not doing this. He was completely submitted to his father. Y'all know who else was completely submitted to the will of his father even unto death? Jesus. It's a complete, perfect picture of Jesus and his love for us. And here's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. He was completely submitted. And Jesus told his disciples, he told them, you don't, he, he told them, you're not taking my life, I'm giving my Abraham was not taking Isaac's life. Isaac was laying his life down. And we come to that moment, and it's crazy. And we think, and because we think this is a story just about Abraham going all in. You've got to understand, Sarah was all in. Isaac was all in. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And here we go. And, and, and here's this moment, and he's bound, and, and Abraham reaches back. He's got the knife and he's reaching back. In that moment, he's fully committed and surrendered and he's going through with the action. If they had put it on a, a movie, it's like that moment where you don't want to look and you're thinking, surely they're not going to put that on film. And it's at that moment you want to turn your head. And at that moment, the angel said, Abraham, stop! Don't lay a hand on the boy. I love this. Because now I know you fear God. You do not withheld from me your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught by its horn. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. 
Look at this, number three. Here's what you're going to find on this journey of being all in with God. This is so awesome, so powerful. I want you to be encouraged. God is a provider, and God loves to provide for his children. Amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. Our God is a provider, and your God loves to provide for you. Here's what's so powerful. Verse 13. God revealed himself. The English transliteration is Jehovah Jireh. In the Hebrew, it's pronounced Yahweh. Yahweh, or Jehovah Jireh. He reveals himself as the God who provides. You know what it literally means? It literally means the God who foresees. The God who foresees. We're talking about pastor. Beyond that, it means the God who literally foresees. In other words, do you know provision is an act of foresight? We don't wait till school morning to get lunches ready and, and backpacks ready and school clothes ready. She's already went to the grocery store and she's already gotten everything they're going to need for the week. And then the night before, we get everything ready. We get everything uh, they get to working on them, getting everything laid out and start doing for themselves. But the provision didn't just happen. That provision is an act of God's foresight. You ought to be encouraged. I don't know what you're facing today, but can I tell you where you are? God, the God of the eternal past, God of the eternal present, God who is the eternal future has already seen it and he's already provided for
And just like that, we can't, many times we can't comprehend that here's a God who has factored in every possible scenario and what happens and has foreseen it and has made a way for us. Think about this. I was reading about C.J. Tan. He's the guy that, from the IBM team that, that, that built and made that computer. Deep Blue. How many ever remember that? This computer that outmaneuvered this chess grandmaster and defeated him. Deep Blue incorporated 32 processing engines that could contemplate 200 million chess moves every second. Every second. I wouldn't want to go up against that. I mean, I've got a hard enough time contemplating 50-50 questions. Vanilla or chocolate? <laughs> yes, no, true, false, right, left. I can't even comprehend 32 processing engines that can contemplate 200 contingencies every second. Yet, can I tell you, that is laughable to an omniscient God. Wow. Who before the creation of the universe understood every contingency that would ever exist and every need you would ever have, not just anticipated and foreseen, but provided for. And I'm telling you, if you can understand that and recognize that, there is nothing that would keep you from saying, God, I am all in. Amen. 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 Woo! Amen. Wow! Abraham knows God's going to provide. You remember and he said, me and the boy, we're going to go worship and we'll be back. I believe Abraham was a man of faith. He said, God, you're going to provide. I don't understand, but I'm believing you're going to provide. And here's what I've learned about God. We focus so much on his character. We forget that God is a God of love. He's a God of personality. God is a God who provides. And how many times have y'all seen it in your own life? God does it sometimes in dramatic fashion. Some of y'all, it's like, he, you know, we used to sing that song. He's never too early. He's never too late. But he's an on-time God. Yes, amen. amen. And some of y'all, it was right in the nick of time. Right in the nick of time. It's so dramatic. Why would God wait when he wears his head back? Why would God wait when the Egyptian army's right here and the Red Sea's right here? Why would he do that? You know why? Because we walk by faith, not by sight. And we have to learn how to trust him. Right. Trust him. Write that down. Trust. Trust. We have to and we have to trust him in those moments. How much do you trust God? Enough to put your eyes on the altar. Now let me just ask this. I'm not saying God's asking you to do this. But when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you, and Brooke and I have asked questions like this to ourselves. You know, are you willing to put everything on the altar for God? What if God asked you? Just put it, what if God asked you to put your entire savings, everything you've built up in your life, and put it on the altar and say, God, I'm going to give this to whatever you lay on my heart to give it to. What you doing? Just think about that. I'm not saying he's telling you to do that, but I want to, I want to help you think in terms of are we all in for God? Are we all in for God? Is it something that, what God, what are you impressing on my heart? I, I, God, I, I love this job, and God, I know that you gave it to me, but if you call me to something else, would I give it up for you? Would you be willing to do it? I'm not saying that he is, but I'm saying we, we've got to have the want to. And here's why. Number four, there's going to be sacrifices that have to be laid on the altar and given to God. If we're going to be on this journey of being all in with God, there's going to be times when there will have to be sacrifices laid down on an altar and given to God. And you know why? Here's what I've discovered. It's not that God wants to take things away. Okay? Every, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, and who is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Jesus said, I've come to give you life, life more abundantly. Everything we have is because of an abundant, generous, awesome God who loves to give to us. The, the, it's, not, it's not about God wants to take them away. It's about are you willing to give it up? That's the issue. And I found that there's times I have to die to certain things. There's times in your walk with God where you're going to have to put certain things on the altar and die to them for God to give them back to you. Man, this is good preaching. 
I'm going to have to listen to this tape myself. I'm a, and, and, and there's times I felt like I could tell you story after story. There's times where you feel like there's things that you have to lay on the altar and die to. You don't know the outcome. But can I just tell you, there's times where you are going to have to be obedient to what God wants you to do because other people will be affected by the outcome. And that's not attractive to an all me, all about me society. And so it, we have to put things on the altar and things have to die so your life can, can influence others for the redemptive purpose of God. When, when you go all in, you don't know how that's going to affect people around you. You don't know how it's going to, that one act of obedience that God says you've not withheld, you're not holding back, you're not holding in. Is there something? Is there something that we're holding on to? Is there something in our life that has crept in and become, we've allowed to become more important to God? Those are tough questions that we have to get along with the Holy Spirit. And would we have the courage to put that thing on the altar? And I can't tell you what would happen. Your story may be different than mine. I put that rodeo scholarship on the altar. And I'm so thankful that I took the course of life that God had uh, destined for me. And not what I had destined for myself. It was tough at the time, but I'm grateful that he did it. And when we put things on the altar, can I tell you, God will give them back to you in a greater way, in a different way. I don't know. I'm not God, but at the end of the day, we hold out on God because we think we're going to miss out if we don't have our little things that are important. But the truth is, if we hold back, we're the ones that are missing out. When It's only when we put everything on the altar. And I love what James chapter 1 verse 22 says about Abraham. And it wasn't this act of obedience that made him righteous. God had declared Abraham righteous. But what you got to see, what I want you to see about Abraham is that this happened out of an overflow of a relationship with Jesus. You start there. You start being so in love with him where he's more important to you than anything else. And when that's there, can I tell you, laying things on the altar, you see it as a blessing. You see it as God moving you forward. And some of you are wondering, why don't I feel the fullness of God's grace? Why haven't I experienced God's power working through me the way I read in Scripture? One of the reasons we have to get along with the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, am I holding back? It can be something as simple as an attitude, something as simple as an entitlement. I don't know. The Holy Spirit is so sweet. And he's not condemning, he's convicting and he'll help you. And he'll put his finger on it and he'll say, here's what we have to do so I can do in you and through you until you're fully on the altar. You have to place yourself in that place where you're willing. Here's what I want to ask you. Are you willing to put your Isaac, that which you would consider most precious to you or that which you're hanging on to, would you lay it down on an altar? And can I just tell you out of experience, I've shared with many of you before I met Brooke, when I was uh, in university, met a young lady, young godly lady, family, loved the Lord, pursuing that relationship. But as the relationship progressed, I began to recognize that this was not, this relationship was not in God's will for my life. Wasn't doing anything improper. Anything like that. Just recognize this was not God's will for me. And I began to fight that. I began to stand against that. I wanted, I said, Lord, I love her. I think she's the one. You know, and I was an evangelist. And I thought, man, look at this. She, she's talented. And her her granddad has opened a lot of doors for ministry for me, and this has got God has got to be. I started wrestling with the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of times I make trips back and forth to Tulsa arguing with the Holy Spirit. There were times I was wrestling with God. The conviction of the Holy Spirit was so got so strong that I recognized that if I was to pursue this relationship, I was about to derail myself from God's plan for my life. 
That is where it was for me. And in one service, this was a Sunday night or a Wednesday night service, that the conviction of the Holy Spirit was all over me. I was trembling, shaking under conviction. Please understand, this is how much God loves you. He wants you to mess your life up. He don't want you to get married and, and a year later be going through the big D. It's not, it's not what God wants. And that's where I would have been headed. And I was sitting there. And we were worshiping. All of a sudden, there's a message in tongues that went forth. And the interpretation was this. Pressure, and here what I, here's what I want you to know. This is totally supernatural because nobody in that church, my church family, they, they, and especially the people that God used, they didn't know my business. It's one thing for somebody to know what's going on in your life, and they say, Thus saith the Lord, I know what's going on. Yeah, you know, don't you? You know my business. You're not reading my mail. You're just telling us all what you know. It's not. It's so awesome how God does that. We know it's him, not a person telling you what they think you ought to do. I think we all desire that and want that. And that's what's so powerful about the gifts of the Spirit. And this interpretation came back. Are you willing to lay down on the altar as Abraham laid down that which was most precious to him? Will give you give what you're holding on to to me? And I sense the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I will tell you, church, I began trembling and crying. And God broke me in that moment. God, a supernatural God, broke something in me. And I said, God, I'm sorry. I'm about to wreck my life, wreck my future marriage, my, my future family, my ministry, what you have for me, because I'm being so selfish and self-centered. And the Holy Spirit so sweetly spoke that to me. And in that moment, I said, God, I surrender and I turn it over to you. And I made a long, hard trip. Brother Tommy remembers that because we prayed together before I made that trip. And I made a tough trip to Tulsa to break a young girl's heart. But now she's married and happy and has a wonderful family. And I think y'all know, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story for me. But can I just say this to encourage you? There's going to be times where you're going to have to lay what you perceive as that which is most precious to you down on the altar. And when you do, can I tell you, there is resurrection life and power and blessing and provision and anointing and everything is going to flow through that. Amen. Let's stand to our feet all across the building. It happened out of his relationship with God. And you know what we see out of Isaac? How could God even think this kind of sacrifice up? We see where he says, you've not withheld your son. We read in another place in scripture where God did not withhold his only son from us. He's a God that's all in, isn't he? He's a God that's all in for us. And here's the deal. All other religions, they're about what can you do for God. How can you better yourself and what can you do out of legalism and performance to draw closer to God and please God? Let me know that's not what Christianity is at all. It's about a God who's already done for us in the person of His Son, Jesus. It's about what He's already provided. It's not about what you can do for God. It's about what He's done for you. And when you recognize that, you'll do more for God than you ever did. Try it out of performance or being feeling condemned. God so loved the world that he gave yeah. his only son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wow. The very scenario we cannot even begin to imagine God the Father has done for us in the person of his son, Jesus. I want you to know God is all in for you. You watching online, God is all in for you. All in. The question is, are we all in? God, am I all in? Let's bow our hearts. And here's what I want to ask you. Maybe this morning you say, God, I want to be all in. I need to give my life to Jesus. I, want to, I need to turn my life over to you. Maybe for you, maybe you need to let this message, you need to kind of let it marinate. You need to take this hand out. You need to marinate on it. 
pray on it and let the Word of God begin to renew and change your mind and, and give the Holy Spirit give you revelation. And here's what I want to ask you right now. As every head is bowed, every eye is closed. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What is He speaking to you about giving to God? Is God first? What's most precious to you? Those that are watching, what's most precious to you? What is God speaking to you? Maybe is there, what are we holding back? What are we holding back from Him? It's not a statement of condemnation. It's a statement of, man, it's an opportunity for a, a dangerous, awesome, adventurous, incredible life with Him that you'll be fulfilled and blessed and enter into the destiny that He has for you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you right now for your precious Holy Spirit. I just thank you for everyone who's here today everyone who's watching online and will watch this maybe months later from now, wherever you are, that they would sense your presence and your sweet anointing, your peace, and the passion and the love that you have for them. That God, you're all in. And before they were even born, you have provided, you have foreseen, you have made a way. every head bowed, every eye closed if you're here and you say, I've really sensed that God is speaking to me to give my life to Jesus, to become a Christian. If you're here, I want to give you an opportunity. If you're watching, I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus. Say, here I am, God, I'm all in. I give you my life. I want to turn from the life, the path that I'm on, give you my life and start a new life in you. I want to die to be what I want. That's you. You say, I want to be born again today. I want to receive Jesus. Count of three, slip your hand. Those of you watching, I want you to pray as well. If that's you, you need to give your life to Jesus. If you've watched this and God's speaking to you and touching your heart, the voice, sweet voice of the Holy Spirit is whispering you and He's calling your name. He's calling you out of that prison cell. Open the door. Say, come into the light. Take my hand. Come into the light. There's a new life I have for you, designed for you, planned for you. I took pleasure in planning it. It's an invitation for an adventure. That's you, and you're here. You say, I want to receive Jesus. One, two, three. Just lift up your hand. Let us pray when you put it down. Yes, yes. Anyone else? Just say, I want to make sure. I want to know that I know that I'm born again. Anyone else? Just lift up your hand and put it down. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray with you. I want to lead you in prayer and give you an opportunity to know Jesus, to be in a love relationship with Him. That's you. You're watching. I want you to pray with us there where you are. That's what's so awesome about the power of the Holy Spirit. You may be in another state from Texas. You may be, this may be five months, a year, five years from when this is being filled. But the Holy Spirit is just as real and He's there. And we want to pray with you. Can we all pray together? Can we pray together and encourage those that raise their hand and those that are watching? Would you just repeat after me? And remember, it's not repeating in a prayer, but if you will believe in your heart, the Bible says, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and that you believe on Him, you will be saved. You make it so difficult, it's so easy, so simple. A little child can understand it. We have to have uh, help in making it complicated. It's so easy. If that's you, can we just all pray together? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, come to you in the name of Jesus, your only Son that you laid down for me. I receive this gift of your Son today in my life. The gift of your love. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord, that you raised him from the dead. Because he lives, I can live also. I choose to live the life that you have planned for me. I'm ready for the adventure, God. I hold nothing back. I lay myself down 
that I can rise again in new life, in power, in authority, and walk in your glory, in intimacy with you all the days of my life. I declare that I am saved. I am born again. I'm no longer a slave. I'm a child of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Shout all in. 